Hello, my name is Nicole Hockley, and I am one of the managing directors at Sandy Hook Promise, a gun violence prevention organization. Yes, a gun violence prevention organization. Um, now, I'm guessing that there are a number of assumptions going through your minds right now based on that phrase, gun violence prevention. Maybe you think that you're going to be hearing a talk about school shootings and what we need to do to ensure our school buildings are safer and more secure. Maybe you think I'm here to talk about firearms and what we need to do at a state or federal level to pass laws that ensure appropriate access. Maybe you think I'm going to talk about mental illness. Or maybe you just think I'm anti-gun, because isn't that what gun violence prevention is? Well, if you're thinking any of those things, then I think you're going to be surprised by what you hear next. Because when I talk about school shootings, I'm talking about the kids inside the school, not about the bricks and mortar that surround them. When I talk about firearms, it's only about the signs and signals that we can learn to recognize before someone picks one up to hurt themselves or someone else. And I won't be talking at all about mental illness as it pertains to criminal gun violence because it is such a small number of mentally ill people that ever go on to commit acts of gun violence outside of suicide. I'm talking about gun violence prevention which has absolutely nothing to do with how anyone feels about a firearm. Now, there are many assumptions and misunderstandings about gun violence, mental health, and school safety. And it's not surprising these misunderstandings exist. There is both a lack of information and a lot of misinformation out there that can be confusing to sort through. I'm not judging. I used to think the same way but now I think differently. So today, I want you to understand what gun violence is, and more importantly, I want to show you that all gun violence is preventable and that you can make a difference in your own homes and communities. I want to show you that gun violence is not just about criminal acts or school shootings or gang violence. And I want you to understand that gun violence prevention is not about the gun or mental illness, a tiresome argument we keep hearing, but is instead about the gun and the mental health and well-being of individuals. Now, I should point out that I am not an expert in gun violence or mental health, but I have made it my, my sole purpose over the last three years to learn from the experts, to study the causes and enablers of gun violence, as well as understand the solutions and barriers in preventing the gun violence in order to provide proven applications that anybody can use and help others to save lives. Lastly, for those of you who think that gun violence is a hopeless or helpless issue in America, I'm here to prove you wrong. Now, I know what gun violence looks like. I learned about it in the most horrific way possible. On December 14th, 2012, a mentally unwell young man with unrestricted access to high-powered firearms went to an elementary school in Sandy Hook, Connecticut and killed 20 first graders and six educators. Both of my boys were at the school the day of the shooting. My eldest, Jake, was eight years old and in third grade at the time. And I still remember the relief I felt when I found him at the firehouse down the road from the school. The feeling of his arms around my neck and my reluctance when I had to pull away in order to continue searching for my youngest, my six-year-old, Dylan. Dylan. I remember seeing other parents finding their children and leaving together to go home. But I never found Dylan. Dylan is my beautiful baby boy with captivating blue eyes, an infectious giggle, and warm, deep 
cuddles. A little boy who liked to look at the moon at night and eat garlic bread and draw big dots with purple markers. A boy who liked to act out scenes from animated movies and practice on the Wii when his older brother wasn't around because he wanted to be able to keep up with him when they were together. A few hours later, I would be told that Dylan had been killed in his classroom, shot multiple times, dying instantly in the arms of his special education assistant, who also died while trying to protect him. So I know what gun violence looks like. I know the impact that it has on a parent, on a family, and on a community. And now I work to prevent it from happening to you. Let's just take a step back for a moment. What is gun violence? And how should we define it? It is gun-related death and suicide, unintentional and law enforcement-related shootings, and all other non-fatal acts of violence involving a firearm. It happens in cities and towns everywhere and does not discriminate by your zip code, although some inner city areas do experience a higher volume of gun violence than other areas. It occurs, on average, 500,000 times per year in our country, a number which has not changed since 2004. Within those 500,000 incidents, 112,000 people are shot and 32,000 die. Of those that die, around 60% are suicide. And we know when comparing that to other data around suicide that there would be far fewer victims and far more survivors if they had chosen to use something other than a firearm. But let's think about children and teens for a second. Of the almost 20,000 that are shot every year, around 2,500 die. That's approximately seven children that die every day in America in a gun-related incident. Now, I could talk for a long time about gun safety and appropriate access as a way to reduce those numbers. But what I'd rather talk to you about today is something that doesn't get as much discussion. Rather than focusing on reducing those numbers, how do we stop them from building in the first place? How do we stop the violence before it starts? How do we recognize people that are at risk? Because people are not neatly defined into two groups, those that are violent and those that are not. We know from research that violence and self-harm emerges from one or more of the following areas. Number one, expression. These are people who use violence to express their feelings of anger or frustration. They believe there's no solution to their problems, so they turn to violence in order to express their out-of-control emotions. Two, manipulation. People who use violence to coerce, control, or intimidate others to get what they want. Number three, retaliation. People who use violence as revenge against someone that they believe has harmed them or someone that they care about. And four, hopelessness. Those feelings of despair that the current situation will never improve and that the future is empty. When combined with a mental illness like depression, this is a red flag for potential self-harm and violence. But we can learn to recognize the signs of violence and self-harm. We can learn to reach out and help people and get them that critical early intervention that they need. Because the real story isn't about what happened on December 14, 2012, when the Sandy Hook shooter accessed his mother's guns and went to an elementary school to kill 26 people. The real story isn't about what happens every day in gun-related tragedies across our country. The real story is about what happens before those weeks, months, or years before someone reaches the point of picking up a firearm to hurt themselves or someone else. The real story is about the missed signs and signals along the way. 
And if we look across America, we will find that most gun tragedies have that in common. Research shows that there are many high-risk behaviors that can be observed before violence occurs. For example, most mass shootings are planned for at least six months in advance, and nearly all cases give off warning signals. Eight out of 10 school shooters tell at least one other person of their plans before they go ahead. 70% of all suicides tell someone else what they're going to do and give off other warning signs. And 37% of students who send violent threats do so electronically, including using social media. So while I believe that there is much that we need to do in the area of appropriate access to firearms, I also strongly believe that we need to focus on the person behind the gun. And here's why. When I think back to the Sandy Hook School tragedy, I know that there was a sequence of events, a chain that had to link up perfectly for events to unfold as they did. My friend David Wheeler, who lost his son Ben that morning, he likens it to a set of dominoes. Each domino stands on its own, with its own start point and end point, from the ignored warning behaviors throughout the shooter's life, to his withdrawal from society and personal contact, all the way to his unrestricted access to the guns. But when we look at it, we don't see the dominoes. We see the spaces in between, when someone could have done something or said something to stop the next domino from falling over. And if we consider that way of thinking for other shootings and tragedies, how many more deaths could be prevented? Because gun-related tragedies are preventable tragedies. The nine-year-old who doesn't find a gun in their parent's bedside cabinet does not go on to unintentionally shoot their three-year-old sibling. The depressed teen who tweets about wanting to kill herself doesn't go through with it because her friends intervene and help her. The would-be shooter, fascinated by other shootings, does not get to live out his fantasies because his threats are taken seriously. The domestic abuser, does not get to use a weapon against his partner because his family is able to temporarily remove his weapons while he gets help to control his rage. And the young person, suffering from multiple traumas, does not continue to withdraw from society, make bad choices, or maybe even join a gang because they get the connections and the help that they need. The list of tragedies that can be averted is endless. We just need to know the signs, recognize them, and stop the next domino from falling. Now, I co-lead an organization called Sandy Hook Promise, made of several families from, from Sandy Hook. <clears throat> Some of us lost loved ones that day, while others continue to feel the ripple effects of the impact of the tragedy on our community. We all want to use our knowledge of loss and prevention in order to stop other communities from sharing our fate. So how do we do that? By providing free training to teach people how to know the signs. By providing free training to schools and educators on youth mental health first aid so that they can recognize the signs of at-risk behavior and intervene. By teaching schools and community organizations safety assessment and intervention in order to assess every single threat, deal with imminent real danger immediately, and also deal with the empty or transient threats by getting below the surface of what's going on in someone's life that's causing them to act out and to intervene before the situation worsens. We teach students, too. Kids are the eyes and ears of their community and often see and hear things that the adults in their lives do not. And we want them to be upstanders, not bystanders. So we provide free training to them on how to recognize at-risk behaviors in their peers, particularly on social media, and say something 
to get help. We also teach them to reach out, start with hello, and include those who may be feeling chronically socially isolated, marginalized, or rejected, and help prevent them from continuing to withdraw from society and maybe going down a continuum towards violence or self-harm. We teach people to stop the next domino from falling over by focusing on the space in between. We teach them to know the signs. And we know it works. In the last year alone, we've trained hundreds and thousands of students and adults across the country. And now we're starting to see some of the tangible impacts of those trainings. We know we helped avert a school tragedy in Ohio. We know we helped avert a suicide in Oklahoma. And we know that we've managed to reduce the number of weapons coming into some schools. And we're just getting started. This is what gun violence prevention is, and it's not difficult. Anyone can learn to recognize the signs of someone who needs help. Think back to the public education, the public health education that you may have had. We've learned how to recognize the signs of someone who's choking, and we know what action to take. We've been trained to identify the signs of someone who's having a heart attack, or a stroke, or who's in danger of drowning, and we know how to get them the urgent help they need. We can learn to recognize the signs and signals of someone who is lacking mental wellness and intervene. That's what Sandy Hook Promise is doing. And I hope that you'll go to our website and join us, get engaged, and start implementing prevention programs in your community. Because gun violence is not a hopeless issue. And you are not helpless in preventing it. There are many tools available to you if you choose to access them. But that's what you have to do. You have to choose. Rather than watching the news at night about the latest shooting and then turning away because you think it's never going to happen to you, choose to stop it from happening to you. Rather than waiting for state or federal government to make laws to curb gun violence, Choose to prevent it from happening in your community. Think about your child or someone you love and make an active choice to protect them. Don't accept gun violence as a social norm in America. Choose to prevent it because it is preventable. Now, I can't go forward without your help. I certainly can't go back in time and prevent what happened at Sandy Hook. I can't save my son. But you can go forward and choose to make a difference. It's impossible to believe that it's been more than three years since Dylan was taken from my family. At times, it feels so fresh, like only yesterday. And at other times, it feels like a lifetime since I've left to hug my little boy. I admit I still struggle every day with my grief. But now, when I hear about another life lost or another family impacted by senseless and preventable gun violence, I don't stay angry or sad for long. I channel my feelings into my work and let it strengthen my resolve to make a difference and save the lives of others as a lasting legacy to my boy, to Dylan. I'm going to close by sharing this little story with you, one that I've told a number of times over the last few years, but one that I first told at Dylan's memorial service. Dylan was autistic and a flapper. And when he got excited or happy, which was all the time, he would jump up and down and flap his arms. I once asked him, why do you flap? I wasn't expecting him to answer, but he did. He said, because I am a beautiful butterfly. And for me, he was. There's a saying that a butterfly flapping its wings 
can cause a hurricane halfway around the world. Well, I believe if a one butterfly can cause a hurricane, then if the millions of people who want to protect their families and communities from gun violence, if they choose to flap their wings, we can do a lot more than cause a hurricane. We can change our country. This will take time. But it's not a question of if. It's a matter of when. Because gun violence is preventable. You just need to know the signs. Thank you.